Yeah, there's, uh, first of all, uh, three lectures from me. Uh, I promise this first one is a bit of a slower introduction into theory in general. Um, and, this, and then the second lecture is a bit more detail of actually solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, trying to capture the, how one of these particular molecules, a TADF molecule, uh, uh, changes in ex ex excited states, what are the interactions that are important, what do we have to consider, uh, and then the final, the final lecture, the one after the coffee break, uh, well, for me anyway, uh, is, uh, uh, is some specific examples that we've looked at recently. This is then followed by Crystal Marion, uh, who uh, will, will give you some more background into the theory. So, I'll start with this. It's good that we, uh, we came to, to Poland because it's clearly a country that needs educating in TADF because when I landed, um, all of the adverts were for QLED TVs. So, um, uh, hopefully when, we, uh, when I next come back here, this will all be uh, TADF. Um, so, as way of an outline, start off by, okay, first lecture we're going to look at what problems are we actually trying to solve. Uh, so I know there are also people here that are doing very much device physics. Um, we, here we're really considering the actual emitter, the, the mechanisms involved in the emitter once the, the excited state is formed, potentially the effect of, uh, of the environment, so the host matrix but we really, we really are on a molecular level. Um, okay, so uh, what problems are we trying to solve? How can we use theory? Uh, what are the different levels of theory uh, that we can use to do this? Um, and then, as I said, the next lecture is more on quantum dynamics, so actually solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Aspects of this, such as developing the model potential energy surface that we, we use, and then uh, the last lecture, uh, Beyond Born Oppenheimer Design of TADF Emitters. Okay, so because it's the first lecture, I thought I, had, I could, uh, could start with this. Um, I suspect you all know, know this, but just to uh, ensure. Uh, okay, so TADF is not a new phenomena. First reported in the literature in 1924 when it was actually called phosphorescence, um, and then characterized uh, uh, in a bit more detail by Parker et al. in 1961, where it was called E-type delayed fluorescence after eosin, and, uh, and, and then more recently, from about 2012 onwards, uh, renamed as TADF uh, and exploited for OLEDs, which is why we're all here, have first generation of OLEDs where you only had fluorescent organic molecules, second generation where exploiting hev heavy metals to obtain the fluorescence and the phosphorescence pathways, and then finally where we are now, TADF. And I think one of the important things to remember is that um, one of the, the, the description that was first given by Parker et al. Uh, is an equilibrium picture of TADF. So we consider a singlet state that can emit, a triplet state, which for organic materials is generally non-emissive, uh, and we say that in the longer time limit, so the fluorescence rate is a lot smaller than this reverse inter-system crossing rate, you get an equilibrium between these two states, and this the position of this equilibrium, so how much is in the singlet or how much is in the triplet state, is determined by the energy gap between the two states. And in this case, we can say that the rate of TADF is simply the rate of fluorescence multiplied by the exponential of, this, of the negative energy gap. And in this sense, all we actually have to do is design molecules that have a small energy gap uh, and as large a fluorescence rate as possible. Um, 
And hopefully I'm going to convince you through the course of these lectures, especially the third lecture, that this is not necessarily the case. And we have, uh, uh, we have a lot more things to, uh, to take into account. OK, so how can we provide more insight? Um, quickest thing that we can probably do, and, uh, and what you'll see in, uh, in, many, in many papers, is calculate a Jablonski diagram. Um, have our ground state. We can use some theoretical method. Uh, can be uh, density functional theory or time-dependent density functional theory. It can be uh, more advanced uh, quantum chemistry methods, which Crystal is going to go into more detail on uh, later. Um, we can calculate electronic energy levels, and calculate energy gaps, and calculate uh, oscillator strength for transitions. And we can draw nice arrows of pathways that they go. The advantage of this approach is it's very quick. It can give us uh, a pretty good insight into potential performance. But the disadvantage of this is it will generally only consider one geometry. So in this case, the energy levels that we are reporting or showing here are only at one fixed nuclear configuration. And we know that the molecule will, will move, whether that's just through thermal motion or in a non-equilibrium position in its excited state. Here, we have just a purely electronic picture. So we don't consider the role of vibrational energy levels, so the Frank Condon overlaps. So we're, we're reducing everything in our molecule to purely the role of the electrons. So we can, we can go further level, we can include the vibrational energy levels, uh, we can include also some, um, some multiple degrees of uh, some multiple geometries. This is still relatively quick and we can use both the electronic and the vibrational inf information that we get to get rates of transfer between two states. Um, will generally give us a good insight into excited state mechanisms um, and is, is definitely an advancement on this kind of simple electronic J uh, Jablonski picture. One well, of the disadvantages, um, it actually doesn't give us any insight into the actual dynamics of the molecule. Um, in principle, it's limited to perturbation theory so the weak coupling limit, and also generally two, but you're looking at transfer between two states. So when you have a very high density of states, or, or many uh, excited states that are coupled, then, you gen then this generally rep is more challenging. The full picture, maybe, um, and I hope through the course of the lecture this will become um, more obvious why, but maybe, is to actually perform excited state dynamics. Okay. So, and in this picture, we're perform, uh, we're, um, and in this time, we're, we're thinking about performing quantum dynamics in the sense that we're explicitly solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So, how the, the electrons and the nuclei evolve after the excitation, after the molecule is in this excited state. So we're, we're doing a rigorously correct, but of course there are some approximations, which again we'll discuss more uh, later. Explicit inclusion of the time evolution of electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom, and importantly, the, couple, uh, the coupling between them. But of course, there's disadvantages. This approach is not exactly straightforward. 
And as with anything with theory, the more complicated you get, the more time consuming it gets. OK, so this is quite a, a simplistic picture. But at the, at, the, at the basic level, we can do so-called quantum chemistry to get some idea of the electronic structure of the molecule. We can, at the most basic level, we can perform a DFT calculation and get insights into the molecular orbitals or the, the highest occupied and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals. This can, can give us some degree of insight. Uh, we, can take, we can take this information include the vibrations, we can do something like perturbation theory, or we can explicitly look at the coupled nuclear electron dynamics. And so these two are going to be uh, discussed in more detail by Crystal. And so what we're going to focus here is actually uh, the, the dynamics of the system. Um, so going all the way back to basics. Um, all started here with Schrodinger and Dirac, uh, the Schrodinger equation. And I think the most important thing when addressing theory um, is this quote from Paul Dirac, 1929, in which says that the fundamental math laws for the mathematical treatment of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are completely known. But the difficulty lies in the fact that their application is too complex to be solved. And so essentially from 1929 onwards, theory became a battle of the approximations. So we know how to give a complete understanding, a complete picture of what's going on. It's generally just too complicated to be, actually, to be able to do it. And so we're constantly battling this. We have a whole plethora of, of approximations that we can make. Um, and some of these approximations will lead us to hell. And some of these approximations will lead us to heaven. And so I think the thing that I'm emphasizing most importantly, and I want to try and get across to you during these next series of lectures, is that it's important that we understand these approximations. Because if you, the, the most expensive calculation in terms of time, and the calculation that uses the biggest computer, does not necessarily give you the best result. Uh, you, you have to always bear in mind what the actual question that you're seeking to answer is and what the limitations of the theoretical treatment that you are using um, is as well. And you have to marry those as much as, uh, as you can. Um, this is also um, um, how I like to picture things. We have, we have the real world something, whatever, whatever is happening, uh, say it's an OLED device and shining lovely, lovely light at, at very high efficiencies. And you come along with your experimental observable. You measure something. It can be a spectrum. That's, and then that's observing some aspect of what's going on in here. You also have some theoretical calculations. We can, and we have to try and map not only the theory to what's actually going on in the real world, we also have to link to the experimental observables. So it's only when we have this full cycle going on that we can really claim that we fully understand everything. Um, what do we have to consider? Um, well, through the course of uh, 
these lectures. As I said, we're looking at um, mostly on the molecular level. Um, so consider the alignment of energy levels. So how this contributes. We saw on what the earlier slide this exponential decay in the efficiency with the, uh, the energy gap. And so clearly the alignment of these energy levels is going to be important to consider the role of molecular structure, the role of molecular vibrations, potentially the electron and the hole transfer dynamics or the exciton transfer dynamics, and also the role of the actual embedding environment. Addressing all of these with one theory is nigh on impossible. And so that's why we have a whole range of theories, a whole range of methods uh, that can address different aspects. OK. So when we're designing a theoretical project, when you've gone into the lab, you've created an OLED, which has an EQE of 60% and emits in the red or the blue, and you want to understand why it's working, then this, there are a number of steps that should be taken. This is what we should always bear in mind, that as the accuracy goes up, so does the cost of the calculation. So at the limit, we're explicitly solving the Schrodinger equation. Maybe more. Uh, approximate, we can move to something like density functional theory, um, and then atomistic molecular mechanics, which I believe we're going to hear more from the, uh, the Schrodinger package. Um, and then even down to the coarse grain dynamics in which we no longer have individual atoms, where we're re representing molecules as a lump in themselves, and not considering each individual atom. So, First question, what electronic structure method is required? Okay. How do we solve the structure of the electrons? Can we, can we use something like density functional theory? Do we have to go to uh, uh, more rigorous theories? Uh, um, something like a post hartree fock methods? So um, uh, methods like coupled cluster theory? As soon as we go here, the size of the, of the molecule that we can simulate uh, goes down quite a lot, but there is some degree of accuracy. Um, in, there's a, a significant increase in potential accuracy. Or can we get away with semi-empirical methods, uh, which are incredibly quick, but may fail outside of the, the, the realm of which they've been parameterized for? Sounds rather serious. That's was... a lump of yes. <laughs> um, basis sets. So when we do these quantum chemistry calculations, we have to we have to have a, a, a basis set to solve the Schrödinger equation in. What type of basis set is appropriate? Are relativistic effects important? And to what level should they be included? Obviously, if we're considering um, transitions between singlets and triplet states, we need to consider spin-orbit coupling. Spin-orbit coupling being a relativistic effect um, should therefore probably be included. Are dynamics important? Is, it, is our molecule rigid enough that we can just represent it with a single geometry? Or is there a significant uh, uh, freedom in one part of the molecule that we need to incorporate to, uh, to accurately uh, reproduce its properties. And again, what level do we need to include that? Do we care how the, each individual atom moves? Um, is, can we represent the dynamics that we're interested in um, with balls and springs? And we essentially use snooker ball science and, just, and, and treat everything very classically. It evolves using Newtonian equations of motion. Ab initio molecular dynamics, 
can the nuclear motion be treated classically? But we need to incorporate the quantum aspects of the, of, of the electrons. Uh, and finally, which, quantum dynamics, do we need to treat everything uh, uh, in a quantum mechanical manner? Also, are environment effects important? Uh, is the effect that the, um, either the host or the solvent is having on the molecule that you're interested, does that need to be explicitly described? And if it needs to be explicitly described, is it, is it going to be, can we take it into account in a continuum way? So we just need to take into account the polarizability uh, of the environment uh, or the dielectric constant of the environment? Or are there explicit interactions between a neighboring host molecule and the TADF emitter that we're interested in that we need to take into account? And if this is the case, then, then, we, uh, then we have to have a, an actual, actual atomistic description of the environment. Okay, um, yeah, so as I said before, when considering all of these, theoretical work is not automatically good if you use a big computer that's worked for a huge amount of time. And the reverse is also true. It's not automatically bad if we've used a very low level of theory. If the approximations that that theory makes are perfectly sufficient, and uh, then... Uh, and then we can certainly use them. So one end of the spectrum. Um, so this is a recent Nature Material paper. This is from the group of uh, Alana Spiroguzic uh, in, uh, in Harvard. This is certainly one way you can use theory. Uh, increasingly popular way, uh, high throughput sc screening. Okay? So this is very much at the, the more approximate end of the scale and what they what they did was they took uh, density functional calculations uh, they calculated um, orbitals um, the the homo and the lumo orbitals they calculated overlaps between them to estimate how much the singlet and the triplet states would uh, like are potentially likely to be split they also use this to calculate what, um, or they use time-dependent density functional theory to calculate what the likely uh, oscillator strength, so the fluorescence rate of the molecule would be. And they put this into a machine learning algorithm to try and identify potential high-performing molecules. Now, of course, using this approach, you're not going to be right every time. Um, and you're certainly introducing some degree of error in your calculations. But what this does allow you to do is search a huge number of potential molecules. So the, no the number of potential molecules you could have is, in chemical space is obviously huge. And in here, they were actually able to simulate 1.6 million molecules. Right. So this is, this is a huge... Um, um, number, and if you contrast it to the number that we're likely to be able to study using quantum dynamics, which is what I tend to focus on, in the last year we've probably studied two or three. Okay, so you've got this uh, to illustrate the example of uh, of high accuracy or high throughput. Okay, both both are particularly relevant, um, but I certainly recommend a read of this paper. Okay, so that, um, that is definitely a classical, uh, that is a very static picture, do it taking a structure, optimizing the geometry, and then performing uh, as simple calculations as you can possibly get away with, um, but it's static. So we don't consider any uh, uh, dynamics at all. So, if we're considering now dynamics, have essentially well, four potential routes. There is entirely classical, 
in which the nuclei evolve using Newton's equations for motion, and the electrons no longer exist. We've replaced the electrons with springs that represent the bonds, the angles, and the dihedrals. Um, simulations that consider microseconds of dynamics with uh, um, thousands of atoms is now possible. Uh, and so if you're thinking on the, the, the nan uh, microsecond time scale, uh, then this is certainly uh, probably the approach you're most likely to use. Ab initio molecular dynamics, we, we treat the nuclei in exactly the same way, but we now re reintroduce the concept essentially of the electron. So each, each time step of the dynamics, we calculate the potential energy with some level of, uh, of quantum chemistry. Generally, this is going to be something like DFT. Um, if, we're, if we're interested in, um, in using this approach, the time scale on which we're likely to be able to study is much more uh, the picosecond or nanosecond regime. And the number of, the number of atoms that we can actually include in this uh, is much more of the order of about 100. Okay? So the scale, scale both in time and in size is much reduced. Um, and then two approaches for excited state dynamics. So Bryant's called ab initio excited state dynamics, um, in which we still, we still have essentially classical motion of nuclei, but we can incorporate the interactions between excited state surfaces um, the so-called non-adiabatic coupling, the effects of it in a slightly odd, odd, um, ad hoc way. The important thing to, oh, well, okay, I've got, and then quantum dynamics in which we have the full solution. This approach is obviously going to be quicker. Um, again, but we don't guarantee that we converge onto the correct answer. So this is actually just an example of classical molecular dynamics. Uh, this is actually um, um, classical, uh, some dynamics of, um, of, this, uh, of this molecule here um, using classical molecular dynamics in a, a host of the PEPO. And what we did was... Um, uh, took, took the molecule in its ground state and then mimicked the charge transfer state by constraining one part of the molecule to have a positive region and another part to have an electro, um, a negative region. So we've transferred an electron from the donor to the acceptor and then ran the dynamics from multiple starting points multiple different starting configurations. Uh, so this was actually 20 different starting configurations. We ran the simulations here for, for 200 nanoseconds to see how the energy of the charge transfer state varied during this, this time. And so, in fact, these, these simulations are quite expensive and the result is re fairly boring. You get a, a Stokes shift initially and then um, um, a flat line where these error bars are the standard deviations, so they give you a, an, an idea of what the the uh, the width of the emission is likely to be. Okay, so half an hour in, it's time for equations. Um, so classical is at one end of the spectrum, and as I said before, we're interested in solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. First thing we have to do to do this is to use the Born-Wang ansatz. So we represent 
the full wave function as a product of the electronic and the nuclear uh, wave functions. Inserting this into the Schroeder equation and rearranging it somewhat gives us the time evolution of the nuclear wave function. So this is, this is what we're, we're interested in. We have, our, we have our TADF molecule that's in the ground state. We excite it, whether this be electrical or photo excitation. It's now an electronically excited state. This is not going to be uh, an equilibrium for the nuclei, the nuclei are going to feel new forces according to this new electronic configuration. And so we want to understand how this nuclear wave function changes with time. Okay, so we have kinetic, we have the potential energy surface, so this is how it varies on one particular state. And these last two terms, in terms of excited state dynamics, are the most interesting because these, these represent the couplings between two excited states. Okay. So in this regime at the moment, it's two states of the same multiplicity. So we're not considering, uh, at this stage, we're not considering the interaction between a singlet and a triplet state. But these non-adiabatic couplings um, are, are the, the the interaction between two excited states of the same spin multiplicity that arise from this fast nuclear motion that you have in the excited state because of a non-equilibrium electronic configuration. So, there are various approaches for solving the time-dependent Schroeder equation. Um, we can do quantum dynamics, and in this sense, the main, um, the main methods are we, we, we define a, a grid upon which our wave function moves, uh, and we, before we run the calculation, we actually calculate uh, a model potential energy surface. So we um, we calculate the shape of the potential according to certain deformations of the molecule. The limitations of this, well, so the advantage is that we get, uh, we get a rigorous solution to the time-dependent Schroeder equation. The disadvantages are that, one, we have a multi-dimensional potential energy surface. So a molecule has 3n minus 6 degrees of freedom, where n is the number of atoms. And so, for a, even a small TADF molecule, you're going to have um, 100, 200 degrees of freedom. Right? The, other the other challenge here is that the computa computational expense of this approach scales exponentially with the number of degrees of freedom that you include. Right? So, calculating for more than uh, tens of degrees of freedom becomes very computationally expensive. Other approaches, so this one we, we won't consider too much, in fact. Um, multiple spawning or more likely uh, trajectory surface hopping. Uh, the key thing to remember here is that we now replace our wave function, our nice distributed wave function, with a series of classical balls. They roll over the potential energy surface according to Newton's equations of motion. The advantage of this approach here is that we can now do what's called on-the-fly dynamics because we have in contrast to here, where we have some wave function that's distributed over a large region of, of space, we have a classical particle that is at a single point in space. And so we, at each time step of the dynamics, 
we can calculate the energy of the potential, we can calculate the gradient of the potential, and we can also calculate the coupling between these two states. And so this, the advantage that this approach has is that we no longer have to calculate a model before we run the dynamics. So we can actually perform these simulations allowing the molecule to move in any way it wants to, in un what we would say is unconstrained nuclear configuration space. So, the, so we, can, we can include all the degrees of freedom of the molecule. The disadvantage is that, first of all, we need many of these classical trajectories to, to get something close to the converged answer. Um, generally, we're talking of the order of about 1,000, uh, if not more. In addition, there's no actual guarantee that when you're using this approach, you will actually get the right answer because you're, use, you're, you're using classical dynamics instead of quantum dynamics. Okay. So, really, I think the most important take-home message in this aspect is that both approaches have their advantages. Um, they, the approximations they make are actually, in many ways, completely polar opposite. Um, and, and again, it depends on what you're actually interested in, in it, it, as to which approach you use. For example, if you had a particularly floppy molecule that you didn't really know how it moved, and you wanted to then something like this approach where you can allow your molecule to move in it whichever way it wants is certainly advantageous to begin with. Whereas if you have a molecule that is more rigid, has particular degrees of freedom that um, you know that it moves in, and you want to really drill down into the fine details of the dynamics, then you have the ability to set up these... Uh, uh, quantum dynamics models. Yeah. yeah. So there's just something in statistical models, so to say. You yes, have to yeah. Place test probes, so to say. Exactly. And the more you do, the better yeah. it gets, in principle. In principle, the more you do, the get better it gets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, um, in this kind of diagram where you have um, um, uh, just two states that are coupled, um, it generally works quite well. The more complicated the excited states get, uh, because what you're what you're essentially neglecting is any um, wave properties of your your. Uh, so, yeah, if you um, there are some areas where it catastrophically fails, and it's sometimes hard to predict when these are going to occur. But yeah, it's a statistical approach. Okay, so in the excited state, so if ever we, if. If you're doing molecular dynamics, generally you're going to make the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And the Born-Oppenheimer approximation is you're ignoring these terms that couple the different uh, states. So I said that this allows uh, two states of the same multiplicity to interact. Born-Oppenheimer approximation ignores this. And this is perfectly, this is a very good approximation, and it's the basis of basically everything we do, and especially in the electronic ground state, because the energetic separation between the electronic ground state and all other states in the system is generally quite large. And so any coupling, if present, is going to be, is going to be quite, is going to have quite a small effect. As soon as we move to the excited st state, um, these, uh, the states are going to be closer in energy, have S1, S2, S3, and these couplings need to be incorporated. If we don't do this, then one excited state that we generate lives forever. There's no decay pathways. And so understanding how something evolves in the excited state is particularly important. Um, the complication 
in, so in, in dealing with breakdowns of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation is summarized by this equation here, one of the coupling elements, because as two states come close together, this coupling will become large. And you can even get to the region, the sort of conical intersection, where these states are degenerate. And you can see from this here, as soon as these states become degenerate, this becomes zero, and your, your coupling goes to infinity. Computers don't like dealing with infinity. And so, when we, are, when we are trying to solve these dynamics, we have the two different representations of our model potential to consider. The black line is two potential surfaces in the so-called adiabatic representation. The adiabatic representation is going to be the standard representation that you get from a quantum chemistry package. And here, you follow the numbering of your state, essentially follows uh, it in numerical order. Okay, so the S1 state here is also the S1 state here. So S1 state here, also the S1 state here. The lowest state you always refer to as S1. But along an adiabatic pathway, you may well get a change in the character of the states. So, so the composition of, of, of how your state looks may be different. So maybe here you have a homo lumo excitation, and then over here you have uh, like a homo minus one to lumo excitation. In the adiabatic representation, then this term for the coupling is valid. And when the states become close, then this will go to infinity. So what we tend to work in is what's called the diabatic representation. And this is represented by these red dashed lines here, in which instead of following the numbering of the states, we follow the character of the states. So this looks a lot more like... Uh, something you'd see in Marcus theory. Um, the advantage of this is that the, 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 the potentials that we get are a lot smoother. They don't have these discontinuities associated uh, with um, the energy gap when it gets to, to zero. But one of the challenges is that we now have to convert, we have to take our adiabatic representation that will come out from quantum chemistry and convert it into the uh, diabatic representation. So this is, so we'll, we'll talk about this a bit more in the next lecture, which is straight away. <laughs> um, okay, um, so I, I, uh, to just to kind of summarize from the first, this first lecture, um, okay, there's, there's many, many ways you can do a computational project. And the important thing is to remember the approximations that you have, that you have to make. Um, because ground state calculations um, have been done since essentially computational chemistry was begun, uh, this is much more well defined. It's much easier to find what you should and shouldn't do. Um, but in the excited state, it's slightly less clear, but in many ways, it's much more important um, because these calculations are more challenging. So you have to bear in mind uh, at what level you treat the electronic structure theory. And this, is, uh, um, this is what Crystal is going to talk about much more in the next lectures. Um, and then for these, is consider how you treat the dynamics so you understand how things are moving in the excited state. And importantly, this this breakdown of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation in which we can no longer consider just each individual state as an individual state. We have to consider how they interact and couple and then how that affects the dynamics. So 
yeah. This is the end of the first part, so it's probably a good idea to take, take five minutes. And, uh, and also, uh, if there's any questions, uh, 